afternoon and good evening to our members and guests joining us from around the world and welcome to the third and final day of our Chartered Banker Annual Banking Conference 2020, supported by our great friends and colleagues at our partner institutes, the Asian Institute of Chartered Bankers based in Malaysia, Finzia in Australia and New Zealand, Australasia, and EBTN, the European Bank Training Network. It's fantastic to have a global conference and a global audience, uh, especially because today we're focusing on our greatest collective global challenge as a finance profession, how we can align our strategies and activities to tackle the climate emergency, uh, but more broadly create sustainable prosperity for all. And I think we'll be looking at the many aspects of that in just a moment. I'm Simon Thompson. I'm Chief Executive of the Chartered Banker Institute, and I'll be chairing our international panel on green and sustainable finance in about 15 minutes or so. First, though, it is my very great pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker on this subject this morning, Fiona Stewart from the World Bank. Fiona works for the World Bank's Global Capital Markets Group, which provides policy advice to governments around the world. Recently, that's included a, a focus on climate risk and sustainable investment, both clearly linked, of course, and, and, and both already having an impact on public and private sector investment and returns. The World Bank's work encompasses banking, investment, pensions and insurance, uh, but Fiona will speak this morning about developments in banking in particular. Bef before she joined the World Bank, Fiona was previously head of American Express Asset Management in Japan, and she is chartered, although I'm afraid not a chartered banker, but a chartered financial analyst. I'm afraid we can't all be perfect, but nonetheless, we're delighted to welcome Fiona. Fiona, over to you. Good afternoon, good morning. My name is Fiona Stewart. I'm part of the long-term finance team at the World Bank. I'm based here in Washington, so apologies for the recording due to the time zone. I wish I could be with you physically, as well as in time zones in London, but um, um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to talk to you all today. Um, I wanted to run through some of the uh, trends that we're seeing globally at the bank. We obviously work globally in a lot of emerging markets um, around the world in different on uh, what we're seeing in terms of deepening sustainable banking um, after the, the impact and through the impact of the, of the COVID and the pandemic, which is obviously hitting our client countries globally. Three things I wanted to run through. Um, one was a little bit about uh, the immediate uh, green markets, the green financial markets. Um, two, about the regulatory push and the regulatory developments that we're seeing. And then three, just some frontier edge areas that um, that we see developments on, which I think is quite interesting and be great to uh, hear about uh, what's happening in the UK as well. So in terms of the, the markets, um, obviously we're doing a lot of work in terms of the build back better, the, the post um, COVID stimulation packages are starting to be thought of. We're working from the immediate stimulation we had at the bank, about 160 million um, package we put together for over about 100 countries working in. We're starting to think of the next phase and how you build green finance and, and a sustainable recovery um, into the packages of the countries that we've put together. Um, many countries were actually seeing um, some very good embedding um, of, of climate, of, of nature, of, of um, using different opportunities to address these issues as well as the immediate health and job crisis. Um, countries like um, Korea, which did a very good job last time in terms of the financial crisis green recovery. Countries like Pakistan, Egypt, um, a lot of uh, things like renewable energy packages going in there. Things like land, um, Pakistan has uh, dedicated a whole new set of uh, national parks and land restoration as part of their recovery. So um, other countries less so, um, to be honest, it's mixed, but some were actually seeing putting sustainability and, and green at the heart of their stimulus packages, which is something we're very much supporting at the bank. Um, to support that, you obviously need finance and the green bond and green loan markets are very much developing globally. So we see issues coming out for countries all over the world. Um, and I think what's interesting with the green markets is how it's spreading geographically from Europe 
um, to Asia and Latin America and to other countries, but also spreading, I think, in terms of, of topic. So it started very much with bonds, uh, very much in the energy sector. We're starting to see new sectors like water, um, transport, and also broader from green bonds to sustainable social bonds. Um, some of the immediate recovery to the COVID we saw some development banks, for example, in Europe, issuing COVID bonds um, to support the health uh, system and the immediate recovery for small businesses. And we saw things like the pension funds buying some of those COVID bonds issued by the development banks. So it's broadening from a green market to a social market, and that's uh, a trend we're seeing. Um, Mexico issued a sovereign STP bond last week, which was very, very well supported and very oversubscribed. So the green bond, green loan market is certainly developing. And I think beyond banks, pension funds, etc., the capital markets are getting involved. And then a second trend in terms of regulation, um, still very much we're seeing uh, the, the green agenda being embedded into regulatory frameworks globally. Um, the central banks are very much leading. Um, many of you I know will know and have uh, maybe involved with the NGFS, the Network for Green Financial System. Um, they're doing very good work in terms of um, looking at uh, green regulation. Uh, it's starting, I think, with reporting regulation, um, starting with things like taxonomies and labels, but also looking to see um, can, would, can or should prudential regulation um, also have a green angle to it. Um, in countries like China, we've seen the central bank in China, um, they have green credits, a green credit market, which then affects the cost of capital of the banks. Um, and then moving again to other sectors, Chinese regulators are looking at um, securities at, at, the, at the pension sector. Countries like Bangladesh, they actually have a target now for green lending from the banks. So very much led by uh, the central banks, and again, it's going global. Um, we know the ECB um, is very much looking this up at this question of beyond market neutrality. The PEFD, I'm sure many of you will know and have, have been involved with the Task Force for Climate Financial Disclosure. Um, our UK colleagues are very involved in the PEFD and, and making that very much global and very much accepted. So very interesting developments from the regulators. One thing I think we've seen globally is that where this is really working is when the regulators and the industry, such as yourselves, works very closely together. So there's many of these task forces, task forces coming together um, for green financial system. Um, the UK have a very good uh, roadmap for their green financial system. Um, we know the regulators in Mexico, again, for example, are coming together to form one. Uh, many other countries. So where you have this partnership between regulators and the industry working closely together is where we really start to see green markets really starting to come together. Um, Colombia is another good example. We're working with regulators in Colombia at the moment, very closely involved in, in discussions with the banking sector and the non-banking sector, insurance and pensions, to really embed green into the financial sector in Colombia. And then finally, I just wanted to finish on a couple of um, issues which I think, are, I think are interesting and are very much frontier in terms of green finance. Um, one is a topic and one is on the topic side, we're hearing a lot about nature. So that uh, biodiversity is the new climate. Biodiversity is where climate was five years ago. How do we build nature risk, biodiversity risk, into our risk assessments um, for balance sheets, financial sector, and also for opportunities? How do we invest in uh, nature protection, conservation, nature-based solutions? Very much a growing area. Um, we've just had a, a new mention of TNFD, Task Force for Nature Financial Disclosure, has recently been launched. Um, and that's following again to see what, what data is needed, what targets are needed, how do we report on them. The PNB, the Dutch Central Bank, was the first central bank to do an assessment to try and see if, uh, how nature risk affects the financial, se financial sector, the balance sheet of the financial institutions in the Netherlands. Very much a developing area. It's difficult. Climate, you have one target, you have more of a measure. Nature is much broader, much more diffuse. You don't have the, the, the numbers there yet, but it's very much coming. So I think nature is the new climate. It's one I think post post COVID in a green sustainable uh, banking and financial sector. I think it's an area that's very much coming. 
And on the instrument side, one interesting thing we've seen is this idea of sustainable loans or sustainable linked bonds. And therefore, I think the market is moving to the green sustainable finance market, is broadening from use of proceeds, labeled bonds like green bonds, to this idea of sustainable linked. So you actually have performance indicators, which if the um, borrower hits, the actual change of cost of capital will change. And again, I'm sure many of you know um, some of the energy sector we've seen some of these, the health sector, uh, food sector. Um, but there's a lot of interest in sustainable linked loans. The difficulty is finding the right APIs, the right indicators that are robust, are stretch, are enough of an ambition, are easily measured. Um, but I think it's an interesting area and one where I think we can see developments and hopefully we start to start to see impact. So the financial uh, instruments we are linked to impacts and outputs. Uh, and I think that's a very interesting area that's starting to grow. So that's a, a whistle-stop tour of some of the things that we at the World Bank are seeing globally in the green sustainable market. What I will say, it's growing. There's no question. It's coming. Um, it's, it's broadening. It's geographically growing. It's deepening in terms of the depth of the markets. And it's also broadening in terms of the type of products and the type of topics that are being covered. Um, we're doing a lot of work from taxonomies, from data, to instrument creation. Um, very much leading, uh, leading edge in the UK. I know a lot of your uh, counterparts are very much leading edge in this area and we'd be delighted to follow up with you in the future. Thank you very much for the invitation and I hope to follow up with you all in the future. Thanks. Great, thank you, Fiona. Um, I'm sorry, I think the the volume at times uh, the quality there seemed uh, to come in and out at least it certainly did for me so i apologize uh if that was uh, uh affecting others too um it could be that the uh, the line from washington um isn't great because of uh well who knows what's going on in uh, in washington um at the moment and i'm sure sort of connections are uh, are difficult um we will be posting all the videos afterwards if you want to catch up uh but uh, i'd like to kind of thank fiona for uh, and it's for a very comprehensive overview of, of, of certainly green finance in a post-COVID world from a, from a World Bank and hence a global perspective. And uh, especially for introducing some of the, towards the end there, some of the wider aspects of sustainability, biodiversity and nature-based solutions that uh, we may well come on to ourselves too. So that sets the scene very nicely for our discussion with our panel. Uh, which uh, uh, would like to hear your thoughts too as well on either on Fiona's remarks and if you have a question for me or our panel if there's something you'd like to raise you know please let me know or let us know through the Q&A function on Zoom which you'll find either at the bottom or top of your screen depending on what device you're using. So let me introduce um, our wonderful global panel uh, to you. Uh, first of all, let me introduce Alison Chan, who is the Director of Sustainable Finance at National Australia Bank in Sydney. So good evening, Alison. Apologies, good evening, Simon, good to join you. Hi, uh, wonderful to have you. Uh, Elisa Moskalin, who's Head of Sustainability and ESG at Santander in the UK. And I should also say that Elisa is an incoming trustee of the Chartered Banker Institute, and uh, I couldn't be more delighted to have her coming on board. So Elisa's in London today. Good morning, Elisa. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hello, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Adam Eng, who leads on sustainable finance for the Worldwide Fund for Nature in Malaysia and represents uh, the Worldwide Fund in the Malaysian Joint Committee on Climate Change. So good afternoon, Adam. Good afternoon. Thanks. So just before I uh, turn to our panelists, let, let me offer a few introductory thoughts of, of my own as to, to why green and sustainable finance is such a, a large part of the future for the banking and finance professions and banking and finance professionals, us as individuals. If we think back to perhaps more than a decade ago in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, I think many felt, certainly I felt, uh, that the finance sector needed to fundamentally reconsider its strategies, operations and activities and align these with more socially purposeful, longer term aims and objectives that could deliver greater shared economic and social value. 
finance, in short, should seek to become more sustainable, which in the context we and many others use it generally refers to meeting the needs of current generations without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs too. Now, those, there may be a wide variety of needs, of course, but many approaches to sustainability focus on three key aspects, often talked about in, in terms of a three-legged stool or, or a similar metaphor. So the economy, the environment and society. More recently, and particularly from 2015 with the Paris Agreement on climate change, uh, we've perhaps been focused more on environmental sustainability and particularly tackling climate change. But the Paris Agreement has three objectives. The first is widely known to limit global warming to below two degrees, and we'll assess progress towards this and hopefully agree further commitments at COP26 in Glasgow, now in less, just less than 12 months time. The second objective is also fairly widely known to promote climate resilient development, but the third objective is perhaps less well known, but it's critical to our professional world. Article 2.1c of the Paris Agreement requires us to make flows of finance consistent with low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. And I think it's very telling that the key global climate change agreement has in one of its three main objectives singled out the critical role of finance. And as countries adopt statutory and binding net zero targets, as the UK has by 2050, finance will be expected and required to play a leading role in the transition of sectors or key sectors, including agriculture, energy and transport, but production and consumption overall to sustainable low carbon models. And the majority of the capital required, perhaps 80% or so, will need to come from the private sector. So it's a fantastic commercial opportunity for banks and bankers alongside an opportunity to demonstrate the positive social purpose of banking. But sustainable finance covers a much wider area if we think beyond climate change and more broadly in terms of the UN principles for responsible banking and alignment with the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, encompassing other areas such as eliminating hunger and poverty, ensuring gender equality, access to education and, and fair work, and looking at the environment and nature in a broader sense beyond climate, as we just heard from Fiona. So there's a great deal within that to cover this morning, a great many issues to explore, and I hope we'll have lots of questions from the audience too. Uh, as a reminder, if there's something you'd like to raise, please let us know via the Q&A function on Zoom. But now let me turn to our panel. Let me start by asking all our panellists uh, a similar question to begin with, which for me gets to the heart of one of the most important issues around sustainability and, and, and picks up on my opening remarks. And that is, what do we mean when we talk about sustainability? And, and you know, are or should our sustainability priorities be the same depending on the customers and communities we serve? So, uh, Alison, perhaps I could come to you first in, in Sydney. I mean, what, what aspects of sustainability, if we look, uh, take, a, take a broad view of it, are, are kind of most important to um, to NAB and if I can put you on the spot to speak for the whole of Australia as well, uh, to Australia as a nation. Sure, so uh, I mean I consider sustainable finance to be financing anything that furthers the, the goals of the, the, the full 17 sustainable development goals, um, but you know, of course that will um, depend on geography and state of development uh, as to you know, what is most critical to a particular um, organisation or government and you know, in the Australian context, um, you know, we clearly have um, a, a lot of land that we need to look after, so and biodiversity is key. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, the nature of um, our economic activity uh, is very emissions intensive, um, and so you know, we need to focus on um, climate change, uh, as does everybody, um, but, I, but I think that you know, we, we have a lot of work to do there. there. Um, and, and that's certainly important to me and important to um, National Australia Bank. Um, I mean, I guess if I were to choose a, a second um, SDG that, that, are, that is close to my heart, um, it would be hunger. Uh, I used to serve on the, the board of a, a charity fighting food poverty in the UK. Um, and I think that's a really topical issue uh, in the UK at the moment, uh, especially with holiday hunger, um, with, with the kids not going to school. Um, and, and from the NAB perspective, uh, the second key um, platform is um, affordable housing. Um, and, uh, and so I, I hope I've answered your question. 
Yes, great. Thank, th no, th thank you. I think that's a good answer. And it's, uh, um, it's kind of interesting to hear it from that perspective as well, and that, uh, that actually, uh, I mean, affordable housing, um, you know, that, that may be a, a key topic for, for NAB and for Australia, but I, I think there are very, very few countries, if any, in the world where that wouldn't be a, a sustainability priority as well. But then that also starts to get linked into issues around around climate and things when you have sort of coastal communities who are who are at risk and may have to may have to move where they're going to move to and how, how are we going to kind of pay for that and so on uh, great um elisa um so i mean santander is a, a a global bank um i mean how do sustainability priorities change across the geographies where you operate and uh, also i didn't mention at the start but you know you have personal experience of, of other parts of the world through your previous work at Vodafone as well. So, you know, please feel free to, to, to bring in that perspective too. Sure. So it's very interesting. So I found that what we call the material issues, the important topics uh, for uh, a company varies a lot according to, of course, the industry. Uh, if you are a Unilever, you know, sustainable supply chains will be very, very important. Um, and if you are a bank, probably financial inclusion, climate change, um, inclusive digitalization, especially if you're a retail bank, uh, ethics and culture uh, will be incredibly important. Um, but not only they vary according to, to geography. So, uh, you know, if you take, uh, um, the UK, uh, ethics and culture, uh, fighting um, corruption, very, very, very important, very advanced as well. Now you move to other geographies and, and uh, you, you need to put much more effort and maybe you have much more work to do to achieve that. Uh, and I, when I went, worked in Kenya, that, that was very much the case we had, uh, uh, that was a, a big focus area for, for us. But, but what's also interesting, I find, is that um, not only the topics uh, change, so, um, and Alison makes a good point, right? So if you work in some uh, developing countries, hunger um, is very much a real thing. And, and, and you might argue it's also in the UK at the moment, which is uh, an interesting um, shift uh, brought uh, by the current pandemic. Um, but there is also a difference in the interpretation of the topics. So let me give you an example. If you are a bank in uh, the UK and financial inclusion is a material topic, is an important topic, which should be, would be, um, you probably will interpret uh, financial inclusion as uh, banking the underbanked, um, providing um, products and services uh, that are accessible to the most vulnerable, maybe to an aging population or to people with vulnerabilities. If you take the same topic, financial inclusion, and you bring it to uh, Latin America, where Santander has a big footprint, or Kenya, where I worked uh, uh, within Vodafone and uh, had the pleasure to, to uh, work with the M-Pesa team, uh, the mobile money platform, then that very specific topic uh, translates differently. It's about banking the unbanked. So the problem is different. It's about how do you provide basic financial services to people who maybe don't have an ID, uh, do not have physical access because they live in the rural areas to, to a branch, or simply do not have what it takes to open a bank account. So how do you bank the unbanked? So, it changes by industry, it changes by geography, and it's interpreted differently according to the geography. So quite a, an intellectual challenge when you have a company with a global footprint. It's an intellectual challenge, but, but, but as, as well as the, um, yeah, as, as well as the, the, the very strong and, and, and important social reasons for for, for banking the underbanked or banking the unbanked. And I think it's a fantastic distinction you bring out there. I mean, there's there's also a really, you know, a, a strong commercial opportunity for organizations that get them right. You know, just as M-Pesa has demonstrated in, in Kenya, and uh, obviously it speaks to, to the idea of, um, you know, uh, uh, building wealth from the bottom of the pyramid and so on. So, so I mean, 
is it is it from a Santander perspective? Is it is it very much part of a commercial strategy as well as a, a, a sustainability and purposeful strategy? Absolutely. And look, when I talk about sustainability, also to board or, or leaders, uh, I pitch it uh, uh, this way. I say, look, there are three reasons you should do this. One is a moral imperative. It's just the right thing to do. Second, it will help you manage risks. And, you know, when you talk about, uh, for example, climate change, it's very evident, it's very clear. Third, last but absolutely not least, there is a massive opportunity, commercial opportunity. And I think to me, so there's, there's three very good reasons, uh, moral imperative risks and opportunities. And to me, M-Pesa is one of the best examples uh, of that commercial opportunity. Because look, the, the product started as, let's, let's give, you know, let's try something. It was a social, you know, product uh, and project. Uh, it started out uh, small as a pilot <laughs> and uh, with the purpose really of helping uh, people transfer money, uh, people who do not have uh, access to, 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 to basic financial services and, uh, and then end up uh, uh, spending a lot of <laughs> money uh, in bus fares, finally, you know, and, and today, M-Pesa represents, I think, 24%, I need to look at the latest, but 24% of the revenues of the company. It also represents a product that has uh, really increased substantially, I think, brought up to 70% or more uh, financial inclusion in Kenya. So it's a fantastic commercial success and an equally fantastic social success. So for Santander, it's very much the same. We the sustainability through the lenses of, of course, uh, making our business fit for the futures in terms of managing our risks, but also uh, making our business fit for the future, our bank fit for the future in terms of commercial opportunities, attracting customers and uh, um, having products and services that are innovative uh, and, uh, and support uh, the triple bottom line, you know, the, the bottom line, but also the social and environmental aspects of uh, the bottom line. Great, thanks. Well, I'd like to kind of turn and ask sort of uh, Alison and Adam about some of the commercial uh, aspects uh, in a moment. But first of all, I'd like to sort of bring um, Adam in on that kind of original question. So, Adam, Adam, from the kind of WWF's perspective, you know, you're you're, you're a key stakeholder. Um, where um, where do you see the the priorities for for, for banking, perhaps particularly in the ASEAN? Region and, and and also kind of what progress have you have you seen? Um, you know, you publish a sustainable banking report that uh, tracks this across nearly forty banks in the region. And and what are the emerging areas that you know, in, in your view, we in the banking sector should should now be considering? Just let me first start with um, kind of a bigger picture in terms of the monetary value of nature. So the World Economic Forum has estimated the, that nature is worth about $125 trillion. Um, dollars. Um, and, and this is often not priced into the as input and output prices and production of companies, um, let alone financial institution. Um, so while the demand for nature products and services has grown uh, tremendously, especially in the last 50 to 75 years, the planetary boundaries and the biocapacity of the planet to meet this growing demand has decreased. And of course, it has this limit. Uh, in fact, our Living Planet report um, this year found that, the, the, for example, the wild species uh, population has declined on average by 68% since 1970. Um, in this region, Southeast Asia, we are particularly vulnerable to physical impacts of climate change, such as uh, prolonged heat waves, uh, flood, um, uh, storms, especially in Philippines, um, uh, and, and sea, sea level rise. Um, as, as you know, some of the countries, these regions are island-based, uh, although they are much bigger in size. Um, and studies have shown that climate change is also projected to cause the GDP to fall by up to 11% in, in ASEAN. And um, so, so those, those are the contexts in which um, uh, nature is so, so important, uh, not just in terms of the risk, but also the, as a necessity 
or necessary input to the production process. Or yeah. Um, so in, in WWF, we have um, identified sustainable finance as a key program uh, to achieve the WWF global goals uh, in terms of conservation, biodiversity, and, and nature, um, as well as the SDG. So there are basically three objectives uh, of this sustainable finance program at WWF. Uh, first is to influence finance to improve the integration of environmental risks, uh, whether this is in the policy processes or products, products, you can see products as a form of risk solution to, to environmental risk. Number two is also to encourage finance to deliver greater investment for sustainable development. This is where the opportunity lies in terms of product innovation, uh, project finance, and so on. And third, last but not least, is also to use the influence of finance um, to basically drive sustainable practices throughout the rest of the economy, given the close link between finance and, and economy. So at WWF, in particularly, particularly in sustainable banking, um, we look in, into six pillars or six components where we try to uh, influence and advocate for best practices. And this is captured in our annual uh, sustainable banking assessment, which is spearheaded by WWF Singapore and also supported by the national office in ASEAN. So the six pillars here are purpose. Purpose here is basically anchor on what are the sustainability, sustainability strategy and whether banks partic participate in international forums uh, or, or initiatives. Um, we also look at policy, how can banks um, make uh, better policy disclosure and policy coverage as regards uh, sensitive sectors. We also look into the processes as well as the people in terms of capacity building uh, products and also last but not least the portfolio level in terms of ESG risk assessment. So that, that's that's the, uh, the 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 few components that we, we look in. Yeah. As regards and, uh, the the latest. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, could I could I say um would it be possible perhaps you know would you would you be able to kind of share the uh, the link to the report um uh, afterwards sure. and we we can send out to participants because I think people would find that sort of interesting. So, so what's the, what's the current state of play in the most recent report? I mean, are you are you positive and optimistic about the direction of travel in terms of uh, you know uh, embedding climate risk in organisations and uh, supporting sustainable investment, or or are you pessimistic about the the state of state of play at the moment? Uh, I must say we are optimistic. There are quite a number of improvements areas. Um, a number of banks have also made. Uh, quantum leap, if I were to use that, that phrase, uh, one of it, which is a Malaysian bank uh, that has made a tremendous improvement in terms of score. Uh, but as we all know, once you have made that, that improvement uh, to maintain that position is also very uh, challenging because you, you must always be very innovative and up to speed. Um, we have identified a few areas in which the, the banks in this region can, can, can improve further. Uh, for example, most of the banks do not disclose their sector policies uh, in their website or in public domain. And so it's key to, for, for banks to be encouraged to be more transparent. Uh, and, and sector policy here can include no coal, no deforestation, and other uh, key uh, sectorial uh, well, uh, standards or policy that would uh, showcase the commitment of the financial institutions. So, and could, could I maybe bring in Alison and Lisa on that that point of disclosure? Because it's perhaps that's a, perhaps that does differ across jurisdictions. Because certainly, from what I can see, I think certainly the UK and from what I know of Australia, there's a, there is a lot more disclosure now. I mean, in the UK, it's kind of Mark Carney has spoken of the sort of three R's kind of uh, risk return, which are the, the same Adam as. Uh, uh, the first two of uh, you mentioned, but then um, also reporting, meaning disclosure as well. Oh, thank you, by the way. I see you just uh, sent the link around for the reports. I'll, I'll look at that as well. Uh, I don't know. So, Alison Alice and Lisa, is, is there a greater kind of focus in in your institutions um, and, and perhaps in, in the UK and Australia more generally in terms of 
disclosure, whether it's at the sectoral level or 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 things like um, you know more detailed climate risk reports. Um, it was a great climate risk report. I think the terror report from ING there, 2021 this year, was a I thought absolutely a, a fantastic document. Anyway, sorry, I'll, I'll hand over. Alison, maybe would you like to go first? Sure. There's absolutely a drive for better disclosure in Australia. Um, with, with, from our regulators, but the, the corporate regulator, the, the central bank and the prudential regulator, um, all echoing the kinds of sentiments we've heard people like Mark Carney championing. Um, and, and that's driving a, a voluntary um, move towards TCFD disclosure. Um, and in fact, NAB is also um, you know, watching closely the, the task force for um, nature-based um, disclosure as well. Um, and also, you know, we shouldn't forget our, our friends in New Zealand, um, where TCFD reporting will become mandatory. Um, so de definitely um, you know, a growing movement here. Yeah, and I think that the, the UK has been, with Mark Arney, really leading um, these efforts. And I think it's very important. And I'm seeing disclosures really evolving. Um, TCFD in the UK is likely to become mandatory, as you all know, and uh, um, I think that will be very important. But I, what I'm also seeing is a move now uh, towards a more consistent uh, um, standards of reporting. So what, one of the challenges I think we currently have when we talk about non-financial disclosures is the proliferation of frameworks uh, um, and uh, standards that uh, companies can apply. So you go to TRI, SASB, TCFD, um, and, and I've got someone in my team trying to figure this one out. And one of our challenges is you'd like to report on everything, but it, it is quite an effort. And, and what, what's the consequence of that? Comparability, which is a very, for purpose of, of reporting, it, it would make much easier for then investors and, and consumers to take informed decisions if the data that we disclose are comparable. If, if I may add another layer of complexity is not just the comparability, but also uh, when we talk about climate and scenarios is the methodologies. So when we'll talk about DCFD and, and I see Adam nodding um, and, and we'll talk about sectorial pathways to where uh, and that's zero or Paris. Um, comparability of the models will be key because otherwise we, you know, we need to compare apples with apples. And if you use different methodology, we might not be able to do that. Uh, now, yes, it's complex, um, but I think that, and I'm seeing a lot uh, of movement towards sorting out this complexity. So as you know, uh, that there are now efforts to uh, from from the major uh, standard settings uh, globally to uh, bring standardization, and that uh, it's a very welcome move. Um, there are uh, efforts also and discussions, uh, uh, definitely in the UK, uh, about uh, scenarios and, uh, and what should be used. So I think that we will figure this out um, collectively. Uh, but it will take a collective effort uh, and it will take, I think, a lot of collaboration uh, between uh, um, the industry, different players, banks, but also uh, government and academia and, uh, uh, and, and, and the civil society expertise. So, Alison, did you want to come back in there? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I absolutely agree with Elisa that comparability um, is, is a goal of reporting and standardization of methodologies will, of course, contribute to that. And, and also standardization will contribute to aggregation of all the scores to look at an industry wide or country wide impact. But having said that, I wouldn't wait for um, those standards to be developed on an industry or company wide basis, because I think even independent um, reporting is valuable. It, um, as long as people are adopting a consistent methodology year on year, it allows them to measure their own impact um, and, and, and to drive forward improvements and to quantify improvements that they've made. So I mean, all, all for comparability, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold my breath for it. No, I, I, <laughs> I totally agree. Don't hold your breath. It will end up badly. But uh, um, definitely, um, so, so, you know, the first step is a journey, like everything. Sorry, I know it's an overused word, but it is um, what it is. 
and I think you're absolutely right, Alison. We, uh, my team and I, are making lots of efforts in terms of, uh, um, you know, contributing to the thinking while we improve disclosures and transparency, because that's the very first step. And, and the fact that we don't have a, a standard shouldn't become an excuse for companies not to disclose. So, so totally with you. And it still creates value. So look, the reality is that transparency and disclosure, even if it's not yet comparable or not as we'd like, as far as we'd like it to be, it's useful. It, it gives information, it creates transparency, and uh, it will enable us. It will, it's the first step for us to work in towards that standardization. Can I come in here? Um, yeah, I totally agree with Elisa and Edison. I think another point to add here is uh, having a, a clear cut and science based taxonomy. Um, whether it's at national level or at least at the, at the financial regulatory level. Um, so in the case of Malaysia, we are in the process of uh, developing a climate change uh, principle-based taxonomy. Um, so there are, there are lists, of, there are six uh, guiding principles and there's also a classification system. Um, so that would help uh, financial institutions and to some extent uh, the corporate clients to, to know uh, to what level would one asset to be considered as a grey, semi-grey or green and, and brown. But having said that, I also agree that we shouldn't be just waiting for a taxonomy to be produced and, and doing nothing. Um, for example, there's one example in, in Singapore where the, the, the DBS, uh, the largest bank in Southeast Asia, has its own version of taxonomy uh, and is publicly, publicly available. And also, of course, it has also obtained uh, second party, second third party um, expert review of the taxonomy. So private private sector in terms of financial institution can also kickstart their own taxonomy in consultation with experts, um, in addition to the regulatory and, and governmental efforts. And, and uh, thanks. And I think on the on the taxonomy point as well, um, you know, there's no need for institutions or countries to reinvent the wheel. We, we now have the EU Sustainable Finance Taxonomy published. Um, and I think just saw about, was it about 10 days ago as well, it was announced that um, there's a, a, a common ground working group between the EU and China to try and align taxonomies. And my understanding is that actually, you know, it'll end up looking very substantially like the EU one. <laughs> um, so I think that probably emerges as a global standard. And then, Elisa, I think you were alluding to, when you're talking about standardization there, were you alluding to the, um, the work the IFRS are doing at the moment? Uh, so that's the, those are the people behind the international accounting standards, um, which of course are international, except in the US, um, uh, which will be always perhaps be slightly different. Who knows where that goes? We won't get into that debate this morning. Uh, but again, they, they've got a, I think the consultation from the IFRS is open till sometime in December, um, but they are planning quite a major project to try and sort of standardise large aspects of, of reporting. Um, but maybe moving on from reporting to return, actually, if we if we use uh, the, the 3R taxonomy uh, that Mark Carney provided. Um, you know, as we've talked about, there's a strong moral case for sustainable finance, um, but we've also alluded earlier to there being a strong business and commercial case uh, too. Um, so you know, where, where do you see the opportunities for financial services in general, the greatest opportunities for financial services in general, and, and perhaps you know, your institutions in particular where that's applicable, kind of both commercially and in terms of sort of wider contribution? Um, I don't know, sort of Adam, would you like to give us a kind of a, a stakeholder perspective first of all? Um, you know, if, if you if you stopped working for WWF and became a chief sustainability officer or chief executive officer in a in a bank in Malaysia or Singapore, you know what would be the the first thing you would do in terms of uh, aligning your strategy around sustainability? I think my colleagues on the uh, are listening, so <laughs> yeah. Um, so when we start off with when we talk about opportunities, we also always look at what are the blind spot and the gaps. Um, I mean, it, it's quite well known the fact that, that the uh, World Economic Forum has estimated 2.9 trillion investment gap per year to achieve the SDG, but not, not so known is the, um, the amount or the requirement that is needed to preserve and restore ecosystem alone. So that amount is, it ranges from 
300 billion to 400 billion uh, annually, um, and, and but only 52 billion is invested for, for such purpose. So you can also see a huge gap within the, the overall SDG gaps. Um, so, so that's one, one on the gap aspect. Um, I would like to quote um, a recent study by Vivid Economics, and uh, this is interesting because it's also commissioned by the UN Principle for Responsible Investment. Uh, and it's also in line with the movement of companies uh, announcing their net zero emission target by 2050. So in that, that report that was launched uh, just last month, uh, it shows that corporate demand for forest-related carbon removal or nature-based solution could generate an annual, annual revenue of 800 billion by 2050. And this is valued at about uh, 1.2 trillion market cap uh, today, and MPV. And which would surpass the current market cap of major oil and gas company. Um, we have seen that over the last uh, couple of years, from 2019, there, there has been a significant increase of companies committed to net zero. Um, the figure shows that from 500 in 2019 to 1,541 in 2020. And this movement has actually driven the demand for nature-based and technological solutions that actively suck carbon from the atmosphere. Um, so as we can see that there are many uh, investments in the renewable energy and energy, energy efficiency uh, sector, uh, but not so much has, in terms of focus has been given to the carbon sink approach. So this, this report um, basically highlights the, not just the demand, but also the opportunity that uh, that significant focus will also be given to the carbon sink approach. But that there's there's also uh, studies that have also shown that um, um, nature based solution is also more cost effective uh, because it's natural in, in that sense, and it also creates more job opportunities. So last month, uh, the International Labour Organization and WWF has also come, come up with a report on nature based solution and the the multiplier effects from the jobs created. Uh, whether it's in China, Vietnam, even the US, and there's a number of statistics that shows different multiplier effects in terms of job creation and livelihood gains in different types of nature-based solutions. So that, that would, would be one thing that um, they will focus on uh, rather than competing in the red ocean of renewable energy. Um, it's, a, it's a great example as well, because then it's also, as you go on to talk about job creation as well, it, then uh, it's a good example of how Sort of supporting sort of one aspect of sustainability supports wider aspects of sustainability too. Um, but you know these these are big numbers you're putting out. You know, five hundred billion here, one point two trillion here. You know, this all starts to add up. These are very very sizable opportunities. So, so I mean, I know this is a very complicated question, but if you can answer it kind of you know quickly. So you know, if these opportunities are there, what's stopping us at the moment? Yeah, the, I think it is uh, a, a very recent movement in the sense that um, nature-based solution has been there for, for, for thousands of years, but corporatization, if I would use that word, uh, or the link between um, big companies' movement or towards net zero and taking that channel, uh, I mean the MBS channel, which is the nature-based solution channel, is still a very new movement. So the, the increase of the numbers of, of, of uh, targets announcement uh, in Malaysia a few, few days last week, just last week, uh, a Fortune 500 company, uh, Petronas, which is a major oil and gas company, has just announced uh, its target by 2050. And one of the channel, apart from this current business model, re reinventing its current oil and gas business model is also to look into investing in nature-based solution. Yeah, so I wouldn't say um, these are big numbers, but uh, it, it is in fact big numbers, but the not, nothing is stopping the corporates uh, because it's, it's a new movement, there's new, there's increased level of awareness, uh, and this momentum will only grow, uh, also driven by the, 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 in the link between uh, zoonotic disease and the impact that we can see now, both socially and economically. Um, the importance of nature and the opportunity that you can derive from from nature base. Over. Great, great. So, um, Elisa, when you're running Santander next year, um, you know, will you be, you know, it's a, it's global. Will you be taking Adams Bank on then in the nature based solutions world, or will you be focusing your bank's 
priorities somewhere else? Where, where do you see as the biggest kind of commercial opportunities for? No, na nature base and that, that's definitely an area that I think each bank should uh, uh, should explore. And uh, I think um, it, it's definitely a, a space where um, financial institutions are focusing on with uh, an increased understanding and evidence that uh, a strong ESG performance uh, has a, a clear positive correlation with uh, commercial performance. And like, I think Simon, you asked the question, I think in my experience, uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, you, you need to build a business case, especially when you work, you know, when you work for, for commercial institutions and, um, it, it, you know, they are uh, uh, commercial driven and I advocate for ESG plus C, <laughs> plus the commercial, because the reality is, and let's be clear, if, a, a bank, a financial institution, or any type of organization is not commercially sound, then it's not sustainable. So I think we should really be careful when we talk about ESG that we don't forget that there is a C there that's that's very very uh, important and uh, and that uh, we we definitely need to think about. Um, but, but to your question, I think uh, you see when when I talk to to my commercial team with my board, my executive team. Um, about how how do we explore uh, sustainability and then what are the opportunities? I, I think that there are some data that 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 really helps. So uh, PwC did a survey, uh, I think a year or two ago, and uh, ninety percent of citizens said that it's very important that banks uh, and uh, and that companies embrace the sustainable development goals. Now, how do I, did I translate that for my teams? It was it means that your customer says that this matters to them. Yeah. So it's, it's very simple. It's what matters to your customers. Now, if you say that to a uh, you know, retail uh, banker, they're going to be like, oh, okay, tell me more. Um, what's also interesting, and as a sustainability professional, I'm welcoming uh, is the, that consumers' behaviors and attitudes are changing. So, um, you know, 10 years ago, I think that sustainability professionals like myself were pushing. Now we are being pulled. That's very, uh, that, that's great. Um, what, what I mean by that is we see consumer behavior changing. We see customers demanding for that. There's an increased demand for green products uh, and, uh, and services. Uh, we are getting um, more and more queries from customers about well, how are you using my money? Um, and, and challenges as well. I think you should be doing more, and if you don't, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll switch bank. Um, so, so I think that we are experiencing as financial institutions a lot of pressures, uh, which I think are positive pressures uh, that will uh, help us to move and move quicker. Um, but any change, as we know, requires a bit of time. And to your question, Simon, why is it's because it, it changed, right? So. We're human beings and it takes a bit of time for us to understand, adapt, and react. Um, and, and with that goes also uh, the building capability, which is the work, Simon, that you uh, and your team are doing brilliantly. And, and it is crucial. Uh, and it's something that my team and I have been put a lot of focus on because you see um, sustainability solutions, uh, whatever nature they are, from green bonds to project finance to inclusive, uh, the m -pesos. They, they need uh, people, they need expertise. They need, you know, people who, <laughs> who will think about business slightly differently. And the work that, that the Institute is doing is crucial. So, you know, your uh, climate change module is, is fundamental because then um, it enables uh, uh, people to think slightly different and to, to be, be more innovative. And, add the sustainability lenses to the business decisions that they take. Because it's, this is not, and, and, and I think this has helped me a lot when I talk to, um, in, the, in the bank, uh, don't, don't get scared. I'm not asking you to do something completely new that you don't know about. No, no, no. I, I'm just asking you to do what you do day in, day out, slightly differently. I'm asking you to question when you take a, a business decision, not only about putting your equation or just the commercials, 
but also the environmental impact, the social impact, and, and try and think whether there is an opportunity in that. Uh, and that really helps. Uh, this is dope. So I think, uh, thanks. I, mean, I, I love the addition of the C to the ESG, but I think in fact you introduced two Cs there, because I think C is both commercial and it's the customer lens as well. So I think it's probably two C's ESG and we'll end up with some very long acronym at the rate we're going. Um, but also you took us into another area that I wanted to turn to, to talk about. So maybe, uh, Alison, if I could uh, ask you about this first, which is, which is you know, how, how do we embed sustainability within organisations and, and where should sustainability sit within organisations? I should tell the, the audience we were actually having a great conversation about this before we went, we went live and we said we'd go on to this. I think this is a good point to, to move into that. Uh, so, so yes, where, where, how do we embed this and where should it sit, Alison? So I think you know, one of the biggest challenges to sustainable finance at the moment, or sustainability in general, is the perception that it's a cost, not an opportunity. Um, and so you're know, building that evidence base um, is, is really important um, to show that it is commercially viable. Um, and so that, that would come from you know, working with NGOs, um, and that's obviously a, a management task. Um, but I think that res responsibility within the organisational structure um, is, is spread across different divisions. I mean, even on, on this call, we, we've got um, Elisa, who's in um, you know, this, a sustainability function, a strategy function, uh, and I'm in a much more sort of customer facing commercial function. Um, you're working with our customers to find ways to finance their own sustainability ambitions. You know, alongside us in, in our respective banks, we've got risk experts um, and you know, a whole host of, of, of other <laughs> experts. So it, it's, it sits everywhere within the bank. It, it should be pervading everything. Um, and yeah, I, I, to, to touch on your point about what we were talking about earlier, I, I think it should also um, you have some leadership from the board. We, we need to build capacity um, you know, across all levels of leadership and um, in, interestingly, you know, the, the average age of a, a non-executive director, at least in the UK, is over 60. Um, and, you know, if you that's a very different generation to most of our customers, most of our employees. Um, so we need to make sure that our boards are well informed on sustainability because millennials, um, you know, have a much higher interest in sustainability and in um, aligning themselves with organizations that, that share their values. And actually, as, and as someone who's in a, a customer facing role, are, are you directly feeling that increased demand from customers that sort of Elisa mentioned earlier? Um, so my customers are, are corporate customers uh, who are looking for finance and they are absolutely feeling the pressure from their stakeholders um, to, to transform the way they do business. They're, they're being asked questions every day from, from people who are considering whether or not to lend them money. Um, what are you going to do with this money? How, how are you making an impact? Um, and that's partly driven by the fact that the investors themselves are accountable to their investors. So you know, it's incumbent on all of us um, as people building pension pots to ask the people managing our money, what are you doing with it? Um, and, and holding them to account. Simon, I'm far too passionate about that first question, so you, I'll, uh, I'll have to, to, to jump in here. Uh, Alison, totally agree with, with everything you said, and Simon, if you allow me, um, very passionate about where sustainability should sit, and, and I've been on, on a journey, uh, even personal journey, uh, to elevate sustainability in the business. I am a strong advocate that sustainability must sit around the table where decisions are made. And I've been on a, a mission to elevate sustainability within the organizational chart of every organization I've been working for or talking to. That means that uh, I believe, you know, you have to have a chief sustainability officer or a uh, ESG expert that has access uh, uh, or sits around executive teams and committees. And I am seeing with pleasure that uh, a number of boards are now bringing in sustainability ESG expertise, which I think is crucial. 
And uh, at Santander, we've done a lot of work on this. We have uh, built a very strong governance. We have brought sustainability at the heart of our business and our uh, executive team agenda. Uh, we are a constant feature uh, of executive uh, committees meetings, uh, and uh, and we uh, and and we have a board committee that has uh, oversight on this agenda. And I think this is very very important. Now, connected topic is uh, then the board needs to be asking the right questions, and there is a lot of work to do, which Simon and I will pick uh, up aside uh, around. Uh, um, how NED and the uh, uh, board uh, can be brought up to speed because to the point that Alison made is that they, they, they are not typically ESG experts or, or people who are not have been as exposed uh, to, to the ESG or sustainability transformation. So how do we support them and make sure that they ask the right question? The NED or a board or a chair who ask the wrong questions on this topic can do a lot of damage. That's a great, that's a, that's, that, that's a great point. I think um, yeah. so. Um, uh, Adam, this was something that um, you know, you know, in the uh, in the work WWF's been been doing on um, uh, looking at uh, uh, the banks in in ASEAN. You said this is one of the indicators uh, you've been looking at. So, um, where does um, sustainability sit in terms of of governance and structures within with, within banks? Um, I mean. Uh, I know it's always hard to generalize, but kind of how, how, how would you characterize the, the positions of the, of the banks you analyze? Are there, are there any examples where sort of one or more institutions does it particularly well, do you feel? Yeah, yes. so the result shows that um, overall 74% of the SS banks uh, last year, based on uh, annual reporting and sustainable reporting last year in ASEAN has improved their scores compared to the year before. Um, and we have seen some significant improvement as well, um, particularly in, in the top three uh, banks being uh, the Singaporean banks and, and one Malaysian bank. Um, in terms of uh, uh, climate change, for example, the more banks are also recognizing the importance of climate change to society and business. Um, there are also more banks that are engaging with uh, regulators um, and and also more banks setting uh, sustainable finance targets, which is actually a, a key, uh, well, a key uh, component of, of governance and strategy uh, at the board level and senior management. Um, there's also a significant improvement in terms of pr um, product level, whereby banks are also increasingly in integrating ESG elements into their product instances, especially in Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, having said that, um, there is also a lot, number of areas in which um, the sustainability practices can be improved. For example, um, not many banks have looked into um, the whole supply chain uh, that requiring not just the upstream but also the mid and downstream um, to also embed sustainability across. Um, so traceability is also one key key indicator, uh, especially in in the palm oil sector and and forestry sector. So this is not something that, that all banks are uh, focusing on. Um, not, not all banks are also partner uh, with the global standards or initiatives. Um, although we have, um, I think in ASEAN there are three banks that are part of the uh, UN principle for responsive banking. Um, so, so at least there's this, I think that there's one, I think two banks um, have just announced this year. Uh, another bank the three banks announced it in, uh, in 2019. Um, but we, we would like to see more and more banks uh, in being involved in all these uh, international standards because not only that, that is a shown a sign of commitment, but it's also about knowledge transfer and, and knowledge sharing. Uh, the same as in the case of the central banking uh, world, whereby you have the NGFS as well. Fiona mentioned just now. I think the Central Bank of Malaysia is also benefiting significantly from being involved in various work stream uh, within the NGFS. Over. Great, thanks, thanks, Adam. Um, and then maybe moving on to the sort of final 
point I wanted us to discuss today. Uh, and in fact, at least you, you alluded to this in, term, um, in terms of kind of your, 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 your journey as well. And, and that's, and it's a question we've, you know, we, we've, we've had from the audience here and, and from others as well, uh, many sessions, uh, things where people have, have asked, well, how do I get into sustainability? You know, um, this is a really exciting area. It's, it's something that, um, you know, Greta Thunberg, David Attenborough, my chief executive are all talking about. My, my kids, my grandkids are, are pressurizing me and saying, what are you doing? What are you doing in these areas? Um, but it occurs to me, none of us on this, on this call, in fact, most people who work in sustainability roles, we didn't leave school and university and say, we're going into sustainability. We somehow fell into this. Um, so I guess, would you be happy to talk a little about your own journeys to where you are now? Um, and also what, what advice would you give to people who would like to um, work in sustainability you know, within finance or more, or more broadly? No, Alison, would you maybe like to, to go first? Sure. I mean, it's very fresh for me. I, I joined sustainable finance just two years ago after a career as a banking and finance lawyer. Um, and so I think the first thing um, you know, would be to follow your passion. Um, and that, that would be, that would lead you to informing yourself on you know, the, the issues that um, are most important to you. And that will naturally uh, take you to um, you know, the, the geography or the sector uh, or the product that um, is most relevant um, and where you'll, you'll be able to have um, the greatest impact. Um, and I think I would, one of the things that, that really helped me um, you know, make the transition was volunteering. I, I just I took time out from the law and I started um, volunteering with Climate Bonds Initiative. I saw Sean Kidney speak at a conference and, and I was absolutely mesmerized. Um, I had absolutely no idea at the time how influential and important the work is um, that Climate Bonds Initiative does. But that was a really important um, experience for me because it, it helped me um, you know, understand the issues, get to know the jargon and importantly, um, build a network. Um, so th th there's plenty of uh, information out there for, for people who are um, looking for it. And you know, this has always been an open source kind of industry. Um, you know, it's the nature of, of what it is, aiming for collaboration and working together. But I think that the, the pandemic has um, meant that even it's even more accessible. Um, so, and you know, pe people are very generous with their time. And um, you know, if, if people are enthusiastic, uh, you'll always be able to get a virtual coffee out of them. Yeah, it's true. Well, I mean, a, a virtual coffee is is certainly more sustainable than the uh, the kind of going to a uh, one of the big one of the big chains and having a paper cup, isn't it? Because you can be uh, you can be having coffee at home in a reusable mug, um, and there's no travel involved. So, so yes, that's a good that's a good shout. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for mentioning the the Climate Bonds Initiative. I, I, I'd agree, they're a fantastic organisation, and uh, yeah, Sean is 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 hugely inspirational. Uh, because he had a bad accident uh, earlier this year, but I think he's recovering well now. Um, so we certainly wish him well on behalf of the, the Chartered Banker Institute. Um, so, this, so Adam, I mean, you're you're now doing something very uh, differently from the start of your your career uh, in many ways, having seen your your full biography. So, so what was what was your journey, and what what advice would you give to to others? Sure. Um, yeah, um, I've somehow coined this um, concept called 10 Ps. Uh, um, it started off with six Ps uh, when I started my career, but then over time I increased it, uh, added, added on uh, another four, so there are 10 Ps. Um, so the first P that I would, and this is not just applicable to sustainability, but uh, more and more broadly from a career perspective. Um, the first P is principle. So whether the career is in line with your, your own principle, your own worldview um, and values, uh, that that's important. And number two, and then I agree with Alison, is your purpose. Uh, what is the higher, higher or long-term purpose associated associated with the things that you're doing? Uh, the third is passion. Uh, that that is uh, very important because uh, would, that would be the the oil that keeps the the midnight oil burning. Um, or maybe the yeah. And the fourth is basically the prospect. Um, so when I first started um, my career, uh, sustainability in Malaysia wasn't really uh, the in thing. Uh, it was more of Islamic finance. Um, as, as you know, Islamic finance has close um, similarity with uh, 
sustainability. Um, in fact, self finance goes beyond sustainability by looking also at, at the form, which is the contractual aspect of things. So, so, so there's no much point of uh, funding renewable energy uh, too much with debt, because that would also increase indebtedness. And so you can have a lot of renewable energy, but at the same time, you have countries are uh, overly indebted, and that would have social economic uh, issues as well. So that, that balance is, is important. Um, the fifth P is the people factor. So um, as what Alison mentioned, you get good, nice people, nice colleagues, nice bosses and, and support system. So that, that's also very important. Um, the, the sixth P would be probably uh, more capitalistic, uh, well, the pay and the perks. Um, the other P's are like uh, the pressure, the, the pace, not everyone can can do a medical housemanship that you works that you work uh, 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, and sometimes it also depends on what is the, are you in the position to make um, in meaningful changes? And position here is not so much about whether being, you're being the CEO. Um, there's, there's a nice book by Robin Sharma on uh, the leaders without title. So you can, you can um, be a leader and you can be in the position of when you make meaningful changes as a leader, even if you're not uh, having that title. Um, the ninth and 10 P are, are basically the performance. So is that, uh, is the company that you're joining performing or is the overall um, cost sector performing? And we can see that, uh, especially in the, the crisis time, uh, period, uh, this COVID crisis that ESG, a so number of studies have shown that ESG has outperformed both in terms of portfolio performance with risk adjusted return. And last but not least, the 10th P is the, the place um, where, where you're working with it, far from home and, and yeah, outside the country and, and so on. Wow, so are, are, we, are we going to see a book on this sounds like a book, the 10 P's oh. of career success or something? So uh, uh, when, when's it coming out? No, there's no, no, no there's, there's a one book that I'm planning to read. Um, I, and also I, I was, um, mesmerized by it when I was um, part of my journey to the intellectual discourse of sustainability. Uh, Professor Ag uh, Alex Edmonds from the London Business School, I think he has a, a recent book uh, called Growing the Pie, and that's where you combine, instead of seeing shareholder interests and purpose of sustainability as a conflict, um, or you need to do as a trade-off, um, his, his, his thesis is basically to expand the pie so that you get more of shareholder interest and at the same time more of purpose or sustainability and other stakeholders as well. Yeah. So that's, that's one book that I, I, I would recommend. It is, no, I, I can thoroughly recommend it too. And in fact, unfortunately, we, we were going to have an institute event with uh, uh, with Alex, um, but that was one of the ones that was scheduled in February and just got caught out by the, by the lockdown, unfortunately. Um, but yes, it's got a lot of coverage in the UK. Um, so, Elisa, what, what about yourself? You, you, you've had a, a very interesting uh, journey through sustainability, uh, I know. Um, and I know you also get a lot of people asking, asking you, you know, well, how do I get a, how do I get a job like yours? So, um, so, Elisa, how do I get a job like yours? Yeah, so, so I think that I am uh, the, the one who started in sustainability. <laughs> so my whole career is, is in sustainability and ESG. Uh, and I've seen it uh, evolving in, in the past decade or so, uh, which has been exciting. And, and, and Simon, the, the interesting thing I mentioned before we joined the call, when I actually started, I was told, oh, you'll never have a career in sustainability. Why, why do you want to do that? Uh, it's really niche. You're going to be a bit of a tree hugger. Um, and I remember that conversation. I was a, a very young graduate uh, and, I, and, I had, and I gave it some thought. And I thought, but then I, I decided, no, I believe in this. I'm passionate about this. And you know what? I will create my path. And it's going to be hard, but, but I will create it. I will, uh, um, you know, uh, that's gonna, I'm going to make that my mission, to, to make a, a sustainability a career, a proper career. But I think that sustainability is a bit like HR. You remember maybe 20, 30 years ago, HR was this thing that you would give to someone who... A bit of spare time right and, and now it's become a profession and it's really professionalized uh, you've got uh, uh, branches and so on and so forth i think the sustainability is going through a very similar journey um so, so i i embarked on the journey and uh, but let me be clear if anyone is thinking to to to, to go this direction it's hard 
I, I think you have to know this. It's hard. You have to be very resilient and you have to be very competent. So uh, I spent a lot of time, I've invested a lot in uh, education, in upskilling, uh, and I keep on doing that because it's, it keeps on evolving. So it's something that uh, I myself, um, despite all the investment, uh, I have to keep on investing and putting the effort in. And I think that Simon, you in the Chartered Banker Institute is doing a great job. I know you've got a number of curriculums now that uh, touch upon the topic. So I would invite everyone to, 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 to look, and there are many others as well. Uh, so so I, I would say anyone who wants my job, I would tell you two things. Uh, one, don't invent it, please. And, and sorry, I'm being very blunt here, but uh, I think it's, it's very, it, it's the death of a profession if we just invent it. We need to be competent, it's important. Um, and, and therefore do invest in upskilling. I'm sure that, that the organizations will support you in this because this is a growing uh, uh, topic and, and every company uh, is interested. So that's, that's great, use that. So, so do invest, do link, look at the Chartered Banker Institute to find uh, uh, um, you know, courses. Uh, uh, so don't invent it, invest in, in uh, upskilling. And, uh, and second, uh, do not throw away your expertise. So, um, you know, I think it, it's very important that if you are a uh, structured finance expert, if you are a mortgage expert, uh, um, you can and you should still do sustainability and actually we need you. Um, so your expertise is crucial. What you can do is become a sustainable mortgage expert a project finance sustainable expert. And I had someone recently coming to me uh, saying, oh, you know, I, I need a change in career. I want a career with purpose. So I'm going to drop everything uh, and I'm going to retrain. And I'm a, I'm a marketeer, I'm a PR person, but I'm going to retrain. And I told this person, don't. I mean, don't throw it away. We need, mar I need marketeers. I need, I would love to have a, a, a you know, a marketeer in, in, in Santander that is also a sustainability geek and, uh, uh, you know the difference that that would make. I it would make my job so much easier. Um, and, and then she went on and did that. So she basically trained uh, on sustainability, but then went to do PR and marketing through the lenses of sustainability. And she came back to me, um, you know, a year later, saying um, just, just now, basically saying, actually, you know, that that makes a lot of sense. And I love that I can use everything I know, but through the lenses of sustainability. So. Two things: don't invent it, and uh, and, uh, uh, and use your expertise uh, in your advantage. Great. Well, well th th thanks, everyone. Some great, great advice all round. Um, and uh, but on that kind of marketing and PR front, I mean, you know, after all, the, you know, one thing nature needs is a good PR agency. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it may it may have David Attenborough at the moment. Um, but, uh, but yes, the more kind of PR professionals, marketing professionals we can get to, to speak up for, whether it's for, for, for nature or for, or for communities that don't have a voice but need a voice, then that's actually a really important part of sustainability, giving a voice to people who, who don't have it, I think. Um, we've actually got one quick question from the audience. I, was, I thought we might manage to get through the whole of this session without mentioning the pandemic, but apparently the audience are not going to allow us to do that. Um, so just to kind of paraphrase the question, we haven't we haven't got long, so we'll have to bring it to a conclusion. But um, basically, it is uh, uh, yeah, it's to do with COVID nineteen, and um, you know what has COVID nineteen has made uh, uh, has has brought sustainability into the into the spotlight for many firms. But then, what's the impact for those that haven't adapted quickly? And um, it says you know is that our model that's easy to adopt if you want to become more sustainable quickly? I mean, that is a big question, but uh, perhaps the easiest way to phrase that would be, you know, if you had one piece of advice for a company, so this could be a financial institution, but it, it could be, I guess, one of the, the client companies that we're, we're working with or financing. If you had one single piece of advice um, that, would, that would help a business adopt uh, and embed sustainability, um, what would it be? You know, difficult question, I know, uh, but I'm gonna ask uh, Adam first. 
Yeah, I, yeah. I, my name starts with the first word, the alphabetical order as well. Yeah, uh, I don't have a, a, a clear answer to that, but um, maybe I can share some of the um, the case for change. Um, so a few years back, MSCI did a very interesting ESG uh, analysis um, on a number of portfolio, and it found some interesting findings whereby um, companies that are already at top at the very um, top of, of their game. Uh, so let's say you have a score of nine out of 10 um, in terms of ESG score. Um, for, for that company to, to have more premium or alpha in, in, in investment terms, uh, it's much harder because for, you're already at nine out of 10 for you to become nine, uh, 9.5, that 0.5 is just 0 0.5 out of nine, right? So the incremental um, value is somewhat uh, little and investors has, has already uh, priced that in. Um, so there's no, no, no much of, of uh, so-called uh, superior returns. But the findings found that those who are uh, not so performing, so, some, so for example, if you're scoring two out of 10, but you improve to four right? and over one year, now you have, last year you were two, this year you're four out of 10. So that is a huge, 100% uh, uh, but almost one time in terms of the, the improvement. And so that improvement actually is in, in investment is called momentum and, and investor basically priced uh, that for, for the, for in terms of uh, alpha and, and more returns. So, so, uh, so in summary, the, the, there is a case for, for change. And even if uh, companies are, who are uh, laggers, the, the, the case is even stronger because there is value in terms of financial value in making such change. Okay, great. Thank you. That's, that's quite succinct, Teddy. Um, Alison, if you've got a single piece of advice, what would you, you know, you, you're dealing with lots of uh, corporates on a day by day, daily basis. Is there a kind of single piece of advice you would give them? Yeah, I, I think we've seen corporates you know, realise that they need to make their businesses more resilient and that they have a social responsibility. Um, if they're not getting those things right, then you know, they're at risk of losing business and they're at risk of losing finance, whether it be access to finance or cost of finance. Um, uh, you know, single piece of advice on, on how to avoid those outcomes, um, conduct a materiality assessment. Look at yourself and also look at your supply chain. And, and that will tell you um, where you need to focus your attention. And, and you probably need to talk to your stakeholders to, to make sure you get the right answers. I, I think that I, I think that's actually a great uh, a, a great piece of advice of look look at materiality when you realise just how material it is that will concentrate minds definitely yeah um, and uh, Elisa uh, a single piece of advice to to leave our audience with pandemic and sustainability um, I would say uh, use it use the pandemic to demonstrate that companies with better ESG perform perform better and are more resilient even in the crisis. And there is early evidence suggesting this. So I would point you to two reports. There is one from BlackRock, which observed better performance of sustainable products with 94% uh, uh, that measured sustainable indices outperforming their current benchmarking indices. And another one from Morningstar uh, that found that 24 out of 26 Morningstar ESG title funds outperforms their counterparts during the pandemic. Uh, so, so I think that uh, um, that shows that uh, you know, COVID, I think, has demonstrated that we need to build more resilient systems. We are much more fragile than we thought. Uh, so sustainability is more important than ever. So I would say that uh, now is the time to press the accelerator uh, not the break. Great, thank you. That's that's a, that's a kind of wonderful uh, phrase to 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 leave to leave it with. I think, and um, unfortunately, we do have to we do have to leave it uh, here as we're just about out of time now. It's been a it's been a hugely enjoyable and insightful discussion for for me as as chair. I hope it has been, uh, Alison, Adam, and Elisa for you too, and for for all of our members and guests listening and watching into whether you're what you know listening live or whether you'll be watching 
on catch up later. Uh, I mean, I certainly learned a lot over the, the last 90 minutes and I hope everyone else has has too. Um, I guess to, to summarize, um, you know, banks and bankers really can help save the world and, and we should, <laughs> you know, we, we can and we must as set out in the Paris Agreement, the principles for responsible banking, which were mentioned uh, a couple of times, you know, they, they play a, a leading role in helping individuals, communities, countries, and our and the whole planet transition to a sustainable, low carbon world that uh, and create shared prosperity for for current and future generations. Um, but picking up on some of the points made during the panel, you know, this transition needs to be led by increasing numbers of finance professionals, whether those are those are finance professionals in boardrooms or whether they're finance professionals in the front line with a, a an understanding of the critical role that what we do in financial services plays in supporting that shift to more sustainable economic models and with the the knowledge and the skills of finance and other areas whether that's marketing or dare i say it at least even hr uh, to be able to develop and deploy products services and tools that can mobilize the capital to support that transition but it's something i'm acutely conscious of um, uh, as chief executive of the chartered banker institute um, that uh, as well as or if we want to mainstream green and sustainable finance we also need to mainstream green and sustainable finance knowledge and skills which is why it's been such a, a major focus for me personally and for the institute as a whole in recent years and i hope in some small way at least this session has helped our members and members from uh, our partner bodies sort of understand the importance of this too uh, but let me let me then finished by saying a, a big thank you on your behalf to Fiona Stewart from the World Bank for excellent keynote speech to introduce this session. You know, uh, huge thanks to Adam, Alison and Lisa for, you know, for sharing your expertise and insights uh, with us. I mean, it was wonderful to get a, a truly global perspective on this, uh, uh, this this morning, this afternoon and this evening. Uh, thanks to the Chartered Banker team behind the scenes, especially sort of Heather, who's been uh, uh, running this for us today, and to Anna and Matthew for putting together not just this session, but all of our Chartered Banker 2020 conference sessions. Thanks to our colleagues at the Asian Institute of Chartered Bankers in Malaysia, Finzia in Australasia, and uh, to colleagues through the European Bank Training Network. Um, and thanks to everyone who's joined us this morning, afternoon and evening. I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Uh, but until then, have a have a great day or a great evening. Uh, and on behalf of the Chartered Banker Institute, uh, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you so much.